scripture comes from 1 John 3, 16 through 24. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commandments and do what, he ple- what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. You may be seated. Just bow your heads with me as we pray to ask God to prepare our hearts this morning. God, we do ask just that, that you would prepare our hearts to receive the message that you have for us. Speak directly to us, Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if I've learned one thing about parenting, it's this. Parenting isn't for wimps. Let me say that again. Parenting is not for wimps especially when it comes to helping your kids with their homework. You have got to bring your A game. You have got to be on top of things. You've got to remember things and recall things from yonder years that you may not remember or recall, or you've got to call in somebody to help you along the way. Been there, done that. But parenting is not for wimps. Here's a little, bit, a little wisdom I found along the way. Phil, I'm showing the screen here. Before deciding to have kids, you should first make sure you are smart enough to help them with their homework. Amen? Amen. I am amazed at uh, kids these days and, and the, the, the things that they're learning in school these days. I mean, take, for instance, sentence diagrams. How many of y'all, are, and Allison, the English teacher over here, going, yeah! How many of y'all remember doing sentence diagrams? Yes, we remember those things. You know, when I was in school, you didn't do sentence diagrams till till eighth grade or later. Uh, nowadays, they're doing them much, much earlier. It seems like you know, and and uh, I, you know, early as first grade. I hear in some places they're doing sentence diagrams. What sentence diagrams? And that early? That's just amazing to me. I was shocked when I heard that from someone one time. You know. I remember all those things they try to teach you with sentence diagrams. There's subjects and objects and adjectives and and adverbs. And and then, of course, there are also the verbs. Now, as a kid, those were my favorite. I liked verbs. Why? Because verbs were action words. You were doing things. You were running. You were whatever the action was. That's the verb. That's the kind of thing that I could get into because I was a kid all about action. This morning, as we look at uh, the first John chapter three, uh, in particular, we're looking at uh, the call to love others. And it's not just a call to love others with nice thoughts. You know, it's, it's not just a call to, to love others, even with just kind words. It's a call to love others with action because love is a verb love is a verb in its essence christian love is that which is to be put into action in our lives a young boy was sitting on the front row watching a a ventriloquist perform his act and and he was lucky enough to be chosen by the ventriloquist to to come up at a certain portion of his act 
and he would sit the boy down on a stool and the, the ventriloquist would then use his, his, uh, his dummy and interact with the kid and the kid got to ask questions and the, and the, little, the ventriloquist would make the dummy talk and, and they went on and back and forth for a few minutes and after he was done with that part of his act, he invited the boy to sit back down. He finished with his jokes and all the things that he did to entertain the kids that day. When the show was over, the kids were all exiting except for that one boy who had been chosen. He had created a special bond with that doll. And so he went up onto the stage once again while the ventriloquist was putting all of his other things away. And there sat the ventriloquist doll leaning up against his chest that he was about to be put in. And the little boy uh, went up to him and, and said, Would you like to come over to my house and play? He said it again because the doll did not react. He said, would you like to come over to my house and play? The ventriloquist saw what was going on and, and saw how the, 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 the boy was talking to the, to the dummy. And he said, listen, kid, just, just go on. Move me on your way. You don't, you just mind your own business kind of thing. And the kid didn't stop. He looked at the dummy. Would you like to come over to my house and play? Finally, the ventriloquist had had enough. He said, beat it, kid. He's just a dummy. He doesn't do anything. He just talks. James is one of my favorite letters in the New Testament. I, I love James because James doesn't hold any punches. James tells it like it is. And one of the things that we learn from the, the book of James is that... Uh, uh, the, the words and, uh, that we have are, are not enough. It's not enough just to, to say we believe something. It, it, James is about our faith and our works matching up. He speaks to the heart and to a deeper understanding about what faith is all about. Faith, he says, is not about mere mental assent to a spiritual concept or a statement of belief. When you read James, what he's saying to us is that faith is also something that radically affects one's life, one's attitudes, and one's action. James drives his point home and state by stating that if our faith lacks work, if our faith lacks action, then watch out, because our faith is dead. Dr. Harlan Roper, a preacher from Dallas, Texas, explained it this way. He said one day a man had a headache, and so he went to his medicine cabinet and, and uh, opened it up, and there in the medicine cabinet sat a, a bottle of aspirin, and he looked at the, the bottle of aspirin. He recognized the name brand. He, he, he knew what the label looked like. He knew that the company that made that, that label and that aspirin were, was a reputable company with a reputable history. He he even picked up the bottle and, and read the instructions about how many he should take. And, but instead of, of taking any pills out of the bottle, he put the bottle back up into the medicine cabinet and left it there unopened. He believed the aspirin would help his headache. He had the faith to do what it says to do, yet does he really have any faith at all if he's not willing to take the aspirin? You know, it's one thing to say we believe something. It's one thing to say we believe something. It's something completely different and real and true when we actually do something about it. As Christians, we know uh, a lot about love. Uh, 1 John, a little bit later on in, his, in uh, 1 John chapter 4, we read these words. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed us his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God's love lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We also read these words from Matthew's gospel in, uh, in the 22nd chapter. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
We've even sung about love this morning. Amazing love. How can it be that you, my king, should die for me? Amazing love. I know it's true. And it's my honor. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. We sing of the, 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 the uh, love divine, all love's excelling. Maybe, maybe one of your favorite hymns is the, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. We sing about it. We know about love. We love to sing about love. We, we love the, this morning's passage where it's said in the 18th verse, Little children, let's not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. Say that with me. Little children, let's not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. The lesson for us this morning is that in the grammar of faith, God never intended love to be the object, an object that we are the subjects as subjects receive. He never intended for it to just be an adjective that we use to describe how we feel. God has intended for love to be a verb. Yet there's a problem. There's a problem in many uh, people who proclaim the faith in Christ. There's a problem in their lives. There's a problem in our lives many times. And the problem is this, that too many Christians today are heavenly minded, but no earthly good. Too many Christians today are heavenly minded, but they're no earthly good. We talk a good talk in front of the crowds. We may think heavenly minded thoughts, but when it comes down to it, too many of us are like the dummy propped up against the trunk. Beat it, kid. He's just a dummy. He doesn't do anything. He just talks. He just posts it on his Facebook page. He just posts it on his Instagram page. Or he just puts it out there and talks about it and talks a good talk. But when it comes down to it, are we really living out our faith by loving others as we should? The book of James tells us that faith without works is dead. God calls us to have a faith that's more than words. He calls us to have a faith that naturally expresses itself in very real and practical ways in other people's lives. Good works which make a difference, a positive difference in the communities in which we live. Good things that, that make a difference in, in other people's lives. Good works that feed people who are poor, that clothe people that are naked, that brings healing to the sick. Good works which share God's good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with a hurting and dying world that desperately needs to know it. That's not somebody else's job, folks. That's our job. To love and to love well. One day a man fell into a pit and he couldn't get himself out of this pit. It was too deep for him. And, and throughout the day, many people passed by this man in the pit and looked down in the pit and interacted. A subjective person came along and said, Brother, I feel for you down there. An objective person walked by and said, You know what? It's logical that someone would fall down there. A high and mighty person came by and said, you know what? Only bad people fall into pits. A mathematician stopped by only to calculate how deep the pit was. A news reporter came by so they could give an exclusive story on the pit. An IRS agent asked if he was paying taxes on his pit. A self-pitying person came by and said, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. Uh, a, psychology, a fire and brimstone preacher came by and said, you deserve your pit. A psychologist walked by and said, your mother and father are to blame for you being in this pit. A self-esteem therapist came by and said, believe in yourself and you can get out of this pit. An optimist came by and said, well, things could be worse. A pessimist came by and said, well, things will only get worse. And then Jesus came by and he got down and he pulled the man out of the pit. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us not be people of just words how nice they may be, but let us be a people of action. You see, as Christians, God is pouring His love into our lives. We are but vessels that receive this love, but we're not meant to be just vessels. We're meant to be conduits through which the love then becomes poured into the lives of others, and not with just words, and not with just speech, and not with just 
positive thoughts or positive energy or however you want to word it, but with good works and actions that make a difference in people's lives. This is what we're called to. Love with skin on. Love that is practical. Love that is true. So as you think about love this week, with Valentine's coming up and, and all that good stuff, think too about how God may be calling you to love someone in need. Think too about how God may be calling you to love someone in a practical way. And then don't just think about it. Go do it. Amen? Amen.